is what's coming up on the well today. President Recep Erdogan makes a visit to areas worst hit by the 7.8 magnitude earthquake that struck on Monday. U.S. President Joe Biden gives his first State of the Union address to Congress, turns the Republicans to control of the House in January. Well, welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani here in Lagos, Nigeria. Turkish President Recep Erdogan was in the earthquake disaster zone of his country today, having faced criticism over the government's response to the disaster. Some families in some badly hit areas say the slow speed of the rescue efforts means they have had no help digging through ruins to find relatives. President Erdogan acknowledged there were difficulties initially, but blamed delays on damaged roads and airports. The death toll has now gone beyond 11,000, and the president had previously declared a state of emergency in 10 provinces. The, this, this is the, being described as the deadliest earthquake in a generation for the president, and is likely to overshadow the run-up to the May elections, already set to be the toughest of his two decades in power. President Erdogan also visited Karamanamara's province near the epicenter of the earthquake. You could hear the ambulance sirens as he visited in the background. He, he later spoke to reporters in the course of the visit, reiterating there was a problem with roads and airports, but that everything would get better by the day. He says the government aims to build housing within one year for those left without a home in the 10 provinces affected. The most destructive in decades, initial tremor, wrought havoc in hospitals, airports, roads. It also knocked down more than 6,400 buildings in Turkey alone. Many residents have since complained about insufficient resources and slow emergency response. The president says citizens should only heed communication from authorities and ignore those he called provocateurs. Let's take a look at drone footage over the southwestern town of Kirikan in Turkey today, showing collapsed buildings and rescue workers still looking for possible survivors. The combined confirmed death toll from Monday's quake has risen more than 11,000. The tally was expected to further rise as hundreds of collapsed buildings in many cities have become tombs for people who had been asleep in their homes when the quake hit in the early morning. Now, along with local residents and rescue groups rescued dog handlers, other German international search and rescue were in Kirikan. The first international rescue is to get to the southwestern Turkey to aid with finding buried earthquake victims. And many in the Turkish disaster zone have slept in their cars or in the streets under blankets, fearful of going back into buildings shaken by the 7.8 magnitude quake, Turkey's deadliest since 1999, and by a second powerful quake hours later. Rescuers are still digging out some people alive from the rubble, even today. Following the devastating quake, authorities released this video of rescued survivors, including a girl in her pajamas, an older man covered in dust, an unlit cigarette clamped between his fingers as he was pulled from the debris. Rescue workers have been struggling to reach some of the worst hit areas held by bad destroyed roads, poor weather, and a lack of resources, as well as heavy equipment. In Salifuro's Burek district, a young man named Berat Kaya and two more people were rescued from the wreckage of the collapsed building. Over in Hatay, rescue teams of Istanbul municipality pulled a little girl from the rubble nearly 50 hours under the wreckage. A newborn baby was also among those rescued from the rubble in Turkey's Hate earlier today. Rescuers worked in darkness in the early hours, digging through rubble and planning the next steps of the operation. First care was administered after the newborn infant, wrapped in a blanket, was carried out of the debris. Other people dug out from the rubble were put on IV lines receiving fluids and medicine. A young boy was taken from the scene to the ambulance. The Earthquake on Monday was the deadliest that Turkey has ever seen. Authorities say some 13.5 million people have been affected in an area spanning roughly 450 kilometers from Adana in the west to Diyarbakir in the east. The viewer is Dorian Jones is in Istanbul. Dorian, great to see you. Let's talk about President Erdogan's visit to the quake areas and 
What, where exactly did he visit? Um, we, we knew about, um, uh, about two places, um, but was he able to get to enough provinces or areas that were hit by the quake? Well, he visited the epicenter of the earthquake, Karaman Marash, where much of the worst devastation has been inflicted. Uh, I mean, but we have to understand that this was a huge area that has been affected over uh, 10 major cities, uh, covering about 13 million people. So it would be very difficult for him to uh, to visit all these places. Uh, it was very much, I think, to show that uh, he was present uh, and that, that uh, there has been this growing criticism over the, the lack of what some people say is a not enough of the state's presence, not enough emergency operators, uh, search and rescue teams, or even the military. Uh, and uh, he was, I think, very quick to push back against that. He said people should not listen to what he called provoca uh, provocateurs. He said he had no time for those people. He said his stomach turns at such criticism. He said this is a time for national unity rather than for, for criticism. Uh, he also pledged that uh, they would step up their efforts to clear much of the rubble and to start rebuilding. He did acknowledge that the response in some ways may have been a little slow. He said there were problems with the airports. A number of them had, uh, had been put out of action and destruction of roads. But he said things were getting better. But this comes as really there is this growing pressure uh, from many quarters in this region that people feel are not enough has been done. According to estimates, as many as 17 thousand buildings have collapsed and we're not and we're talking in many cases large multi-story apartments 10 12 stories high holding dozens uh, of apartments so it is a huge task facing emergency operations but there is a growing desperation given the fact that these are freezing conditions that people are now experiencing well below zero in many cases blizzards freezing rain it's, it's a really appalling condition for those trapped there's a specter of hyperthermia, as well as the many, many other people that are homeless and are looking for shelter. Yeah, and I did think about that. Um, a lot of people will die from hyperthermia than being crushed by rocks and concrete so while under the debris. But the president says things will become better in the coming days. Uh, people are already angered, as you mentioned, by the slow pace of work. But, but it really isn't about the slow pace of work, is it? it? It's because of the magnitude of the disaster. And I know that rescue workers are working as fast as they can. But do people at least believe him when he says things will get better? Well, it's very difficult to say, I think. I mean, for some people, yes, there is this understanding that this is of the sheer scale. But having said that, there are some parts of this disaster-struck region, particularly the province of Antakya, which is on the Syrian border. Uh, we've been hearing that as maybe as much as 50% of the buildings there have been uh, destroyed or rendered uh, in uninhabitable. Uh, stories of uh, many people, dead bodies on the streets and the criticism that there was little on emergency services and search and rescue teams for at least the first 48 hours. Now, uh, President Erdogan appears aware of that situation, said now that there is uh, many, many search and rescue teams have been dispatched, including many from abroad. Uh, but having said that, I think that uh, uh, there is this growing impatience and uh, over the situation because we're talking about millions and millions of people. Uh, there's only a limited amount of time people can sustain living outside on the streets just with uh, uh, using makeshift bonfires to keep warm and a few blankets. The pressure really is on. And particularly, I think there is criticism of the fact that the, uh, from the critics that the army was very slow to be deployed. Turkey has the second largest army in NATO, uh, but the the, Chi, uh, the Ministry of Defense, Hulusi Akar, yesterday acknowledged that only 7,500 soldiers have been deployed so far. Now, given the scale of, of this area, I think there was all a raised eyebrows that people felt that there could have been a lot more military on the ground, given they have the expertise to help in building uh, emergency tent cities, they have helicopters, they have the major infrastructure. So there's a lot of criticism there building up. Uh, and uh, I think also they have the fact that Turkey is in an election year uh, and within uh, by May the 15th, it's expected that uh, there will be presidential and parliamentary elections. So there's a lot of pressure now on the government over this. And it has to be said, there is a lot of anger building up as well among many people who are desperate uh, in the situation they are facing. How unfortunate it is. But some international rescue teams have begun arriving. At least they started putting things together uh, since Monday night. And we know that a lot of them have already 
be put set foot on the ground in Turkey. Do we know what areas uh, they are working at the moment? And could you give us a sense of what's going on on the ground, what's been going on um, with the rescue workers? Yeah, I mean, from the, the very beginning of this crisis, a matter of just hours, uh, the, the Turkish government put out an international appeal for help. And normally, uh, the, they take a, a day or so to, to reach out, given the fact that there is this belief that Turkey has a very powerful state, that they usually don't need such help. But this time, it came out came in a matter of hours, and they really understood, underlined that there was a realization this was a huge uh, natural disaster facing this country. And that international call has been heeded. Uh, as many as over 70 countries have pledged support. Dozens of uh, countries, uh, search and rescue teams that have already arrived from the European Union, from Azerbaijan, even the Ukraine uh, pledged support. Uh, and Russia has also sent uh, emergency teams as well to Turkey. And crucially, many of these teams have come with these search, uh, these specially trained dogs who are, are, are being trained to find people alive in collapsed buildings. And now that is a priority for the search and rescue efforts here in Turkey. They have these dogs themselves. Turkey has experience of dealing with earthquakes. Uh, the whole country is prone to earthquakes, uh, but never on something of, of this magnitude they are facing. So they really are looking for these dogs because they can find people very quickly. Given the fact there are so many collapsed buildings, it helps efforts to pinpoint the efforts and find people. And uh, these dogs and these teams uh, are arriving in large numbers. But given Given the fact that we're talking about, like I said, as many as 17,000 collapsed buildings, the part is absolutely huge. And also the problem is getting people to many areas. Much of the infrastructure of the region has been badly affected. Roads have been destroyed and there is limited access with airports. So there's a problem of getting people across this region, which is a vast area. Uh, so that is an, also a major headache facing uh, these services as we speak. And it is a race against time. People in these buildings are facing now a third night in freezing conditions, and it's going to be very difficult for many of these people to, to survive. But in the previous disasters that Turkey's witnessed, people have survived for as long as a week, more than a week in some cases. And that gives hope to survive the search and rescue teams to carry on their efforts. And hope is what we all need at the time. As for the survivors, what provisions are there for them? A lot of them are sleeping outside, as you rightly mentioned, afraid to go back in because uh, they, there could be tremors and they could be stuck in that. How is the government handling their own existence and their day-to-day -day living? Yeah, I mean, that is it's a really a major point. You're right there that even though uh, many buildings haven't collapsed, uh, they are warned, people are warned not to go back. And, you, and you've seen them because you've seen video of buildings that seem perfectly fine, just suddenly collapsing uh, into a pile of rubble. Uh, and that is because these buildings have been constantly, have been already weakened and uh, the area is still experiencing dozens and dozens of aftershocks, in some cases quite powerful, every day. And that just weakens further these buildings and suddenly they collapse. So people are being told to stay away. But uh, as we speak, there are being tent cities erected in some areas. But we're talking about huge numbers of people, even providing things like hot soup and uh, tea uh, to keep people warm against this freezing, atrocious weather conditions is proving a challenge. But uh, President Erdogan has committed they are redoubling their efforts uh, to uh, to meet this uh, massive mammoth task. They're facing 10 large cities, 10 of Turkey's largest cities, 13 million people. Uh, that is a huge task facing uh, uh, this country. And time is against them. They know this is a race against time. President Erdogan has promised that there will be 10 cities. Efforts to build more 10 cities will be stepped up, as will the reconstruction at some point. But that's going to take a lot of time and a lot of financial resources, which is another headache further down the road that this country will be facing. Very correct, uh, Dorian. I think of you know, how much could go into rebuilding those cities that have been affected. What is it like in Istanbul? I understand the tremor was felt as far as there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the tremors were felt all across the country and, and we still uh, they feel some of the powerful ones that have followed after that. And, um, and this serves as you know, an uneasy reminder to the people of Istanbul. In 1999, uh, there was a very powerful earthquake just outside Istanbul and that killed uh, over 17,000 people. 
And there is the expectation and the awareness that at some point a massive earthquake of the magnitude we have seen is likely to hit this city at some point in the in the near future. So this serves as a very painful reminder to the people here that the, the, the spectre and danger that they live here, live in in this city. And I think that's why in many ways you're seeing a massive humanitarian effort. Here I visited uh, an aid center that's been set up all across the city where people are collecting warm clothes, blankets, uh, the, uh, water, drinking water, uh, food, and things which are now being sent down to the uh, earthquake region. People are working 24 hours a day in these centers all across the city. Uh, hundreds of people uh, are, are boxing up, sending stuff, people bringing supplies to be sent. And this has been organized uh, by the um, the mayor uh, the mayor of Istanbul, Ekrem Imamoglu, who uh, also has dispatched uh, the city's own search and rescue team to the region as well. So there's a major mobilization of support here in Istanbul and in many other cities across Turkey to provide assistance to the people in this region because there's an awareness that this is probably shaping up to be the worst natural disaster that the Turkish Republic has uh, faced in its 100-year history. Dorian, thank you so much for bringing us up to speed and of course you're in, uh, helping us to understand what's happening on the ground in Turkey. Do stay safe. Thank you. A photo captured by a drone and posted online by Sirius White Helmets shows several bodies have been buried in a mass grave in the town of Jandaris. The photos showed civilians standing in prayer over the bodies that were lined up near freshly dug earth before being finally laid to rest. So the combined death toll of the devastating quake rocked southern Turkey. Southern Turkey and northern Syria has climbed above 11,000. As we have been reporting, more than 298,000 people have been forced to leave their homes because of the earthquake, according to state media in Syria. Pope Francis has prayed for the victims of the earthquake. They hit Turkey and Syria. At the end of his weekly general audience, the 86-year-old pontiff asked the faithful to join him in a prayer for the population of Turkey and Syria and appeals to the international community to show solidarity towards the two countries. Governments and international organizations from around the world have responded with offers of support after the 7.8 quake hit uh, the two countries. Pope Francis has sent a telegram offering his heartfelt condolences as the Italian Roman Catholic Church allocated 500,000 euros for emergency aid. With the scale of the disaster becoming ever more apparent, the death toll rose as above 7,000 yesterday. It's climbed up much higher even today. Syria's ambassador to the United Nations says that any assistance, any outside assistance for earthquake victims must be done in coordination with Damascus and delivered from within Syria, not across the Turkish border. Damascus has long opposed the humanitarian operation that has delivered aid into Syria from Turkey, saying assistance should be delivered from inside Syria. And when pressed by reporters if the urgent need of the earthquake response might change that requirement, the uh, Syrian ambassador to the UN said it was a matter of sovereignty. Many Syrians are sheltering in the sheltering in the rebel-held northwest fear that this would once again put their fate in President Bashar al-Assad's hands. Aid flows from Turkey to northwest Syria have temporarily stopped due to the fallout of the earthquake, uh, leaving aid workers grappling with the problem of how to help people in a country fractured by war. A cross-border aid operation overseen by the United Nations since 2014 has been crucial to Syrians who fled Assad's rule during the conflict by passing territory that he controls. In all, in our seriousness, so we continue to use uh, the Babalwa crossing as uh, the transshipment hub is actually intact. However, the road that is leading to the crossing has been damaged, uh, and that's temporarily disrupted our ability to fully use it. Um, we also have the cross line uh, option. Uh, the last deliveries, I think, cross line were around the, the 8th and 9th of January. Uh, we are working on doing another cross line shipment in the coming days as soon as, um, as possible. What I can assure you is that we will res we have always and will continue to respect the territorial integrity of Syria, and we will also respect the mandate given to us by the Security Council. There's still a lot of chaos, 
right? And people are spending a lot of time trying to uh, do immediate search and rescue, uh, trying to find loved ones. Our operations have also been impacted, um, given that we have staff that live in the, in the, in the area. Um, the Secretary General, I think, had a very good meeting with the Syrian uh, permanent representative uh, yesterday. And I have no doubt that all the parties involved uh, will do their utmost to facilitate uh, the transport of humanitarian goods to all Syrians who need it. As I say, it's a chaotic situation. Things people also need to, to recover. We will move as fast as possible. I know the Syrian authorities are moving also as fast as, as possible. There's goodwill on all sides. Uh, but you know, you're, you're dealing here with uh, a, a catastrophe on top of a humanitarian crisis that already. This is an opportunity to put politics aside and to focus on what is needed urgently to help men, women, and children whose lives have been devastated uh, by one of the most serious earthquakes we've seen in a long time. Um, and we hope that everyone will keep that in mind. We're just weeks away to the presidential elections here in Nigeria and run up to the polls in the country. It's usually a chance for small businesses like print houses to cash in on election paraphernalia ranging from well, you have them hats, uh, flip-flops, tissue boxes, and cooking oil labels. But business has been slower than usual. Ahead of the February 25th vote, as candidates have hinged their campaigns on social media. A loud wave fills the back of a print shop in Nigeria's capital, Abuja's machines channel, graining faces of presidential election front runners on posters, flyers, and food packaging. Workers pour cassava fly into blue and green bags, sporting the governing All Progressives Congress Party acronym, and stash them next to a pile of red and green opposition People's Democratic Party rice packets. The CEO of a print shop recalls busier period in 2011, 2015, and 2019 polls. Printing wise, no much difference in our orders. Just a little, someone will come and order a few. Uh, so when you have a few campaign materials, a few b-boards, where the impact on the print industry is not as huge as it was in previous elections. Nigeria, Africa's most populous country, is home to millions of internet users and platforms such as Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube are popular. Social media has been a key campaigning tool ahead of a poll in which, according to the Electoral Commission data, almost 40% of registered voters are 34 or younger. The only thing we have noticed is that there's a lot of hype on social media. Social media has played a lot of role in this. Uh, I think it's because of also the level of youth participation. Not everything has moved online. As parties, they commission political materials for rallies and other in-person campaign events. At the printing mall in Abuja's business district, bold political slogans flash from scarves hanging in the background. We are not seeing those things as strange. It's what we want. In short, the most craziest of order for a printer is a good job. A few printers say sometimes a moral battle between being a businessman fixing logos of memorabilia and one of the electorates with a preferred candidate rages. Come February 25, Nigerians will vote for a new leader to take over from President Mohamed Buhari amid growing insecurity and economic hardship. The front runners have promised to reduce living costs, boost growth, and tackle rising levels of violence. Let's read on to the United States, where President Joe Biden hailed the resilience and strength of the U.S. economy during his State of the Union address on Tuesday, citing job creation and failing ago, unemployment and really inflation. I stand here. According to data in the U.S., unemployment dropped to a nearly 54-year low in January and inflation, which spiked to a 40-year high last year, has been largely trending downwards. On the whole, economic data in recent months has moved in the president's favor. The consumer price index dipped from a nearly 9% annual rate in June to under 6.5% as of December.
while well, gasoline prices, as petrol, uh, has hit $5 a gallon over the summer. It was below $3.50 this week. With the economy on the upswing, President Biden promises he will continue to focus on Americans who have been left behind. After the tepid start of 2022, the U.S. economy ultimately grew by more than 2% for the year after a stronger than expected second half, prompting firms like Goldman Sachs to lower the perceived risk of a downturn. Two years ago, the economy was reeling. I stand here tonight after we've created, with the help of many people in this room, 12 million new jobs. More jobs created in two years than any president's created in four years because of you all, because of the American people. I ran for president to fundamentally change things, to make sure our economy works for everyone so we can all feel that pride in what we do. To build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out not from the top down, because when the middle class does well, the poor have a ladder up and the wealthy still do very well. We all do well. I know a lot of you always kid me for always quoting my dad, but my dad used to say, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. He really would say this. It's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about being able to look your kid in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay and mean it. Well, folks, so let's look at the results. We're not finished yet by any stretch of the imagination, but unemployment rate is at 3.4%, a 50-year low. A near record. A near record unemployment. Near record unemployment for black and Hispanic workers. We've already created, with your help, 800,000 good paying manufacturing jobs, the fastest growth in 40 years. And as we end the program today, the World Marathon Challenge came to a close in Miami. Um, the event uh, sees competitions attempt to complete seven marathons across seven continents in seven days. This year's challenge began in Novo Antarctica. Started on January 31st before stopping off in Cape Town, South Africa, in Perth, Australia, Dubai in the UAE, Madrid in Spain, and Fortaleza in Brazil. En route to the finish line in Miami. The overall winner for the World Marathon Challenge is a runner who manages to run the fastest time on average across these seven continents. This year's winner, international trail runner David Kilgore from the United States, averaged two hours and 56 minutes, despite a time of three hours and 23 minutes in the strong winds and cold temperatures of Antarctica. Deirdre Kean, meanwhile, also from the United States, claimed the women's title, while another American, 80-year-old Dan Little returned to the competition after a four-year hiatus to complete the seven marathons in as many days. This year's World Marathon Challenge also marked the first time a hand cyclist, Great Britain's Darren Edwards, and a wheelchair participant, William Tan of Singapore, competed in the Titanic race, overcoming the elements to successfully complete each stage. Really inspiring. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani. I'll see you later.